Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Thor and Armando. Your idea is even better than you think. I'd also like to take a moment of thanks to all those courageous people we have with us for their lives and for all those who were disappeared, tortured, killed, dis well, just abused by their government. So let's just take a moment to think of all of them. In 1988, we decided to celebrate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in its 40th year, so we did a tour around the world. We got to some of the great artists, Spring, Steen, and Sting, and Peter Gabriel, Yusu Endor from Africa, Tracy Chapman from my country. We played in 16 countries. The tour was immensely successful, and we were in the stadium in Argentina. 100,000 Argentinians were waiting for us, and we were, of course, pleased with how everything had gone. And in that effort with us with the children whose parents had been thrown out of helicopters in Argentina and they had been restored to their grandparents who were with them and they were with us on the buses with our artists. Lo and behold at the bottom of the steps as one of these children exited there was a policewoman who had stolen that child waiting to take her back one more time. A few of us on the bus froze because we didn't know really what was happening. And she ran down the side of the inside the bus, down and got under a seat. And the policewoman went down the outside of the bus, pounding on that on those windows. Before we knew what to do, her little brother, who probably was seven or eight years old, ran down to his sister, took off his little jacket, and put it against the window of that policewoman. I dare say to you, that is the human rights movement at its full power, its full might. Seamus Heaney once wrote a poem in honor of Sean McBride, who was one of the great founders of Amnesty International. And in it, he spoke of how we should be ambassadors to each other, to represent the world to each other. That we, in fact, have a contract amongst ourselves, amongst the humans of the earth. We have a contract to look out for one another and to take care of one another. Many of you in this room have gone to work on that contract. Recently, I think in the last number of years, we've lost some momentum in the human rights movement. I do believe that. And we've got to get that momentum back. Seventy percent of the young people of the world live in what is so-called developing world. We have to take the genius of what you have done and get it to them as soon as possible, in the quickest way possible, so they imitate, and so that those of us on this earth of ours, the millions of us, get these governments to work for us and not us for them. They stand by our ability to vote, to support, to be there. They are not free to abuse. And so if we on earth somehow find a way to unite, where is the United Nations? I say it is with you. It is all the human rights groups in the world united together without a bureaucracy. That is the true human rights and the true United Nations. And in that context, I ask you to think of an idea that we would might press all our governments 
to print the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 60 years old, less than 5% of the world know about it, less than 1% have ever read it. Let us get the government to print their own literature in their own passport so that at least we have a quick way to reach all the young who might find that passport on a dump somewhere and read it and do what Dr. Martin Luther King did in the United States is by holding on to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, he moved the nation forward on his sheer guts. And that march on Washington, of which I was lucky to be a minor, 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 minor figure, it finally ended in the White House recently. You need something bigger than yourself to fight for. And how do we take what, who and what you are out to the world and to these young people and stop these governments from so much abuse, so much torture, so many people hurting. And I think if we absorb the lesson of Seamus she Heaney's poem, that we have a contract to one another. I remember when I was a child, I was fighting for some sense of maturity with my mother, who was a difficult and tough lady. She lost her husband when I was two years old, and I was the 11th child. One day I said to Mom, how am I ever going to be a man? Because she kept telling me be a man. I said, Mom, how do I become a man? She finally looked at me in the eye and said, I want you to hear me. When you learn to walk the highways and byways of life and listen to the weeping and the wailing of the poor, then and only then, my Jackie boy, will you be a man. And I thought, dear God, I'll never ask this woman a question again. <laughs> but I think we need somehow to take the genius of what you've done and give it to the young so this world gets better, easier, nicer that we look at each other across lines and colors and clothes and music with curiosity and decency and look forward to meeting everybody. How do we do that? That's our goal. The past is bloody and awful, isn't it? Can't we look to the future and set one direction and get everybody going that way like King did for us in the States? Aung San Suu Kyi sits in a prison today, whether it's her home or another one, we don't know, but it's a prison. Her freedom won't mean that it's good, but it won't mean that much to her people. She won 82% of that vote. She should be the leader of her people, not just free. She should be ruling in her nation. And so I say to you simply, as I would to anybody, and particularly the kids who are up against the gun barrel, up against the torturer. Take your voice and turn it into thunder and turn your bonfire into a bigger fire so the winds of justice will blow it higher and higher and hopefully it'll be a better world. Thanks.